Hey friend, and welcome to this video. Have you ever wondered where Seventh-day Adventists are in Bible prophecy? Have you ever wondered where, perhaps in Isaiah, Seventh-day Adventists are mentioned? Well, if you've ever wondered that, or if you're curious, this is the video for you. And by the way, this channel, it's all about Bible prophecy, evangelism, and apologetics. So if this is stuff that interests you, then this is the channel for you. Now, we need to prepare ourselves and win others and help them prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this channel will help you do that. So this is something, this is a subject, and this is a channel which will bless you immensely. So don't forget, if you like this video, like, subscribe, and share, and let me know what you think in the comment section down below. Now, before I get to the text, which mentions Seventh-day Adventists in Isaiah, I want to take you to an important Bible principle. Let's take a look. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 9 to 10, says, The thing that has been, it is that which shall be, and that which is done is that which shall be done, and there is no new thing under the sun. See that there is no new thing under the sun, and that which is past is that which is going to be future. That which has been now is that which is, hath already been, and God requires that which is past. Jesus, he's looking for revival and reformation amongst us. And the Bible tells me that the themes of the past repeat into the present and into the future. So when we look at Isaiah, we find out that, yeah, Seventh-day Adventists are mentioned. Bible prophecy is mentioned there. It's all throughout the Old Testament. Bible prophecy is throughout from Genesis to Revelation. And so we need to be students of Bible prophecy. Here, Ellen G. White, she wrote that Daniel, Isaiah, and Ezekiel not only spoke of things that concerned them as present truth, but their sight reached down to the future and to what should occur in these last days. Hmm. So you mean to tell me that Daniel, Ezekiel, and uh, Isaiah, these individuals are were, were preaching, teaching present truth in their day and into our day, into the future? Absolutely. That's what Ellen G. White wrote. And I believe that is founded on the Bible principle, which I just shared with you from Ecclesiastes. Pretty cool. So let's get, in, get into Isaiah and let's look at that text. Isaiah 58 verse 12. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places, and thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. Here are seventh day Adventists. How do we know? Well, this has to do with the prophecy of the foundations of many generations. Many generations before had been dealing with a breach, a breach made to the law of God. Interesting. And that there would be a people who would be restorers. So this prophecy we read in Signs of the Times refers to the fourth commandment, which has been broken down and laid waste. This prophet, Isaiah, brings to view a class of people who see and feel the importance of exalting the day that God has specified as his own, which is being dishonored and disregarded by the Christian world. So which day is being dishonored and disregarded by the Christian world? Largely, it is the Sabbath. And so there is a group of people, the repairers of the breach, which are Seventh-day Adventists. It's in our name, Sabbath uplifting people and Sabbath keeping, might I add. Cardinal James Gibbons of the Faith of Our Fathers here is written, But you may read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and you will not find a single line authorizing the sanctification of Sunday. The scriptures enforce this religious observance of Saturday, a day which we, the Catholics, never sanctify. Wow. So hold on a second. Sunday is not the right day of worship? Well, according to the Catholics, that's the case. Do you want more information? Do you want to learn more about this? Let's look at another quote. The Convert's Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, page 50 says, which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is a Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Well, the answer is we observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. And by the way, we also read here that in keeping the Sunday, the Protestants are following a law of the Catholic Church. So by their own admission, which day is the Sabbath? It's Saturday. Actually, from Friday, 
sunset. Sunset Friday to Sunset Saturday is the Sabbath of the Lord. Saturday is the major day of worship which all Seventh-day Adventists come to worship on Saturday in the morning to study the scriptures, to have Sabbath school, and to understand the scriptures, and to hear a message from God, and to pray, and to fellowship with one another. You see, the, by their own admission, the Catholics, a power had changed by their authority, not God's authority, the solemnity from transferring the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. God never, never authorized that, ever. But it's on man's authority, not God's authority, for that change. You see, there has been a breach made in the law. The fourth commandment, which is right in the center of God's Ten Commandments, it is a law that has to do with time. There would be a breach in the law that has to do with time. A Bible prophecy foretold us of this very thing. There would be a little horn power that was prophesied. And this little horn power would do many things. It would arise out of ten horns or ten world powers. Okay, And, and it would be different, very unique. It would be stout, more stout or more um, proud than its fellows. It would speak great words against the Most High. It would wear out the saints. So it would persecute God's people. And think to change times and laws. Remember the Sabbath commandment is both a time and a law. And it would reign for a time, times, and dividing of time. Now I'm going to highlight speaking great words against the Most High. Has the Catholic Church done this? Yes. The, Jesus, he had claimed to forgive sins. He said, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the question was, well, who is this that speaks blasphemies? The religious leader said. Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, blasphemy is claiming to forgive sins when you are not God. Because God can only forgive sins, and Jesus is God, so he could forgive sins. What does the Catholic Church claim to do? Well, keep looking at the slide. It says, indeed, bishops and priests, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, have the power to forgive all sins. Whoa, wait a second. They're not God, but they're claiming to forgive what? Sins. That's blasphemy. Speaking great words. See, in their catechisms, which are basically their legislation, so to speak, they are speaking great words against God's word, against God himself. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? And the religious Jews answered and said, Well, for a good work we don't kill you, but for blasphemy, because that you, being a man, make yourself God. So what else is blasphemy? Blasphemy is claiming to be God, of this entitlement to Godhood. Now, the question is, does the papacy fulfill this great blasphemous word? Well, yeah. In 1512, Christopher Marcellus said to the Pope, said this to Pope Julius II. He said, "You are not. Uh, you are another god on earth. Blasphemy." It seems that Pope John II now presides over the Universal Church from his place upon Christ's cross. That's making him to be God. The Gloss Extravagantes of Pope John the Twenty uh, Second says, "But to believe that our Lord God, the Pope, whoa, whoa, hold up." You mean to tell me that this Roman Catholic Church is basically saying that the, the Pope is God on earth? What do we call that according to the Bible? It's blasphemy. Remember that little horn power would speak great words, great words against the Most High? What could be a greater word than saying that you are God when you're just a man? That would definitely be speaking against God, wouldn't it? pretty clear, isn't it? From Bible prophecy, we have clearly outlined that this little horn power is none other than the papacy, and it would reign for a specific time period, that it would have unbridled sway, and it would persecute the saints of the Most High for a period of 1,260 days. Take a look at this. Revelation chapter 11, Revelation 13, all talk about this um, trampling of God's people for 40 and two months. This same 40 and two months is actually alluded to in Daniel chapter seven with regards to the little horn power. They shall be given into his hand until a time and times in the divine of time, which is still the three and a half years or the uh, 40 and two months, according to Bible prophecy. So let's first look, what is 42 months in Bible prophecy? Well, we know that each day in Bible prophecy represents a year. So 
360 days are in one biblical year. From the uh, biblical reckoning of a year, there's 360 days, not 365 as we understand today. So if we take 42 months times 30 days, we have 1,260 days, or in Bible prophecy, we're talking about 1,260 days years. So this power, this little horn power, as well as that first beast in Revelation chapter 13, would reign for a total of 1,260 years, and it would be a persecuting power. If we know history, we know that the papacy fits this perfectly. We see that also this time and times and dividing of time represent it represents three and a half years or 1,260 days, prophetic years. So same. I want to share with you here that as we see in Daniel and Revelation, there's this 1,260 year prophecy. And then we have to look at when it begins. And it begins, of course, with the reign of the Pope. The edict of the Emperor Justinian, dated 8533, made the Bishop of Rome the head of all the churches. But this edict could not go into effect until the Arian Ostrogoths, the last of the three horns, were plucked up to make room for the papacy. They were driven from Rome, and this was not accomplished until shown until 538. So the full development of the beast, or the establishment of the papal supremacy, dates from the famous letter of Justinian, which was made effective in AD 538, which made the Pope the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. The papacy was a church that was clothed with civil power. And this papacy had this religious and secular mix to it. And what happened was it would go to the authority of the state and pull from the resources of the state to persecute people who stood in its way. The Pope in 538 was instituted as the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. And that's when the church began pulling from the Roman government, uh, soldiers in arms, also from Europe, uh, to persecute others. Namely, also when it's big persecution and this time of uh, persecution sort of really began in a big way was in the plucking up of the three horns. The, Hul the Hululi, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals were plucked up or they were basically destroyed because these three powers stood in the way of papal supremacy. After those three were uprooted and taken away, the papacy could begin getting its stranglehold on Europe and the surrounding nations. Pretty powerful Bible truth. So 538 AD, now we have to count 1,260 years, which takes us to 1798, when the papacy would receive a deadly wound, as prophesied in Revelation. So General Berthier of a French army entered Rome and proclaimed a republic and took the Pope prisoner. Wow, a deadly wound. The Roman Catholic power fulfills the very letter the specifications of the prophecy, which proves beyond a question that the application is correct. Pretty potent. So we know from Bible prophecy that in fact, the papacy is that little horn power that would think to change times and laws. And that was prophesied in Isaiah 58, that those repairs of the breach, the repairs of the, you'd say, the Sabbath command, the ones that would set the truth straight, would be Seventh-day Adventists. We are the repairs of the breach. God's people are the ones that uplift God's law and uphold the sanctity of the Fourth Commandment, as well as all Ten Commandments. Now I say to my brethren that as we work with all our might, our trust must be in God. Sooner or later, Sunday laws will be passed, but there is much for God's servants to do to warn the people. This work has been greatly retarded by their having to wait and stand against the devisings of Satan, which have been striving to find a place in our work. In 1905, Ellen wrote that we are years behind. God calls upon his workers to humble themselves before him and put away every sin. He calls upon them to hold fast to the word, it is written, and put away all infidelity. We are to humble ourselves before the Lord, and at the same time, we are to be as firm as a rock to principle. God's law is to be vindicated by the obedience of heart and mind and by strong arguments. So God is raising up a people, we read, that are going to vindicate God's law by obedience of heart and mind and strong arguments. And so as we study the Bible and we look throughout the Bible, especially in this channel, we find strong arguments in favor of the truth of God's word. And I pray and I hope that all those who watch this channel and listen to what's given here are people who will follow the law with their own heart and they will vindicate the law of God through obedience of heart and mind. 
Today, I hope and pray that you will be a repairer of the breach. And maybe you're maybe you're just finding out about Seventh Day Adventist, and this, you're just wandered on this video. And you're like, well, what's this? This is wild. Well, I want you to study. Go to the Seventh Day Adventist website and look at the fundamental beliefs and study for yourself the wonderful truths that we have as a people. Check out the repairs of the breach. Study uh, Daniel and Revelation. Study and look for Seventh Day Adventists who can give you the truth. Hey, if you want a Bible study or two. Don't forget that you can reach out to me and I'm more happy, I'm very happy to oblige in a Bible study to prepare you for joining God's remnant people. May God bless and keep you until we study again.